Good afternoon, good people. In the name of all of the Franciscan Sisters of the Sacred Heart, I want to welcome you to our home. It's really a privilege to have all of you here with us today. And for those of you who are online and watching this live stream, hello to you and welcome to you also. Um, here at our home, we have 52 acres and there's a labyrinth and a cosmic walk out there and the trees are all decorated just for you today. So if you have the opportunity, you might want to take a little walk through our woods. Um, our property tends to be manicu manicured in the front and the farther back you get, it's um, more woody and there's even a little creek back there. If you have new shoes on, I wouldn't recommend that today. It's a little muddy, but it's a beautiful spot and you're always welcome to come and enjoy yourself here. Um, we have hermitages, we have a retreat center, and upstairs, if you've not been here before, you're certainly welcome to go and take a look at our chapel. And we also have a lovely picnic scene that was made by our cousin, Sister um, Kay Francis of the Joliet Franciscans up in our sunroom. And just past the sunroom, there's a cave with Francis and the babe. So if you want to take a look at all of that after we're finished here. And those of you online, if you'd like to go to our website, you can see all of that virtually also. So it's our home, and we're very happy to share it with you. So I want to take this opportunity to say how happy and proud we are to be the first in this series of this celebration of the 800th anniversaries that are up here. And if you need anything, there's like a flock of Franciscan Sisters of the Sacred Heart right over there and they'll be very happy, see, there they are, <laughs> to help you with anything you might need. The washroom is right here. There's a I don't know if we need, around the corner there's the men's room also, just right around there. There's another washroom out in the um, hallway out of the back. So um, hope, make yourself at home. Your home is, our home is your home, and thank you for being here. Sister Mary Barbara, I'm going to turn this over to you and your committee. Thank you, Sister Joyce. So I want to welcome everyone to this beautiful day um, as we gather to celebrate what it means to be sister and brother to one another and to all creation. My name is Sister Mary Barbara, and I'm a member of the Frankfurt Franciscans here, and I'm on the, um, one of the team members of the Chicago Region 800th Centenary Committee. And before I introduce our presenter, I would like to acknowledge the other team members of the Centenary Committee. Present in person are two of our members, Jean Connolly. Jean, would you please stand? Okay. She is a covenant member of the Wheaton Franciscans. And Barbara Kwiatkowski is a member of the Joliet Franciscans. Uh, the other three members who were not able to be here in person, but they are online, are Jean Toriski, who's a Chicago Franciscan, Anne-Marie Klasky, a Chicago Felician, and Marianne Dosen from the Lamont Franciscans. And we have been asked to plan events to celebrate the 800th centenary as a Franciscan family. And this, our first event, is to celebrate the Franciscan rule of 1223. Another event is planned for November 25th, at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and this will be sponsored by the Chicago Franciscan Friars. And this event will celebrate St. Francis' first Christmas at Greccio in 1223. And then next year is a celebration of the stigmata of St. Francis. In 2025, we will celebrate St. Francis' Canticle of the Creatures. And in 1226, 2026, 2026, we will culminate our 800th centenary celebration with the Easter of St. Francis when he welcomes Sister Death in 1226. So our plan for this evening is to have Sister Mary Elizabeth present for approximately 45 minutes, 
followed by a half hour when she will take questions, and then followed by some fellowship with refreshments. We have many participants who are online for this presentation, so we welcome them as well. This uh, is being live streamed and also will be recorded at a later date. And now to introduce our presenter for this afternoon. Sister Mary Elizabeth is a member of the Franciscan Sisters of the Sacred Heart. Her educational background is from St. Mary's College, Notre Dame University, and Indiana Purdue University, where she received a Master of Science degree. For her spiritual development, she did coursework through Retreats International and Ignatius College in Ontario. She completed a Master of Arts at the Franciscan Institute at St. Bonaventure University in New York. She has published works, <coughs> specifically a Franciscan Solitude Experience and the Pilgrim's Journal, as well as an article in the AFCU Journal. Her present ministry is Vice President of Mission Integration at the University of St. Francis in Joliet, where she has ministered for the past 13 years. She's also on the staff for the Franciscan Pilgrimage Program and lectures widely as a Franciscan scholar and facilitator. But most importantly, we, the Franciscan Sisters of the Sacred Heart, know Sister Mary Elizabeth as our sister in Christ. So I present you Sister Mary Elizabeth, who will share with us our Franciscan relationship as sisters and brothers. So I too want to welcome you. Um, I am grateful for my sisters and their comments, um, and all of you here as sisters, um, and online too. So this will be pretty exciting for us. Um, before we really begin, um, I was conscious of the gospel for today, coined for Caesar, whose face was on that. So it's true we live in both um, our spiritual world, which we'll do a little bit about that today, but also our civil world. Um, I don't know about you, but it's been a heavy week of news. And just to acknowledge that, the horrific fighting in the Middle East, the Russian-Ukrainian border, and throughout the African nations there are at war that can't decide which coin they're going to live off of. But at the same time, we celebrate the unification of the provinces of the friars, so some, some pieces that are there. Um, and all of this is rooted in relationship, our topic today. So I hope that um, you can take away what I've done in, in preparing for this is a sense of hope. Um, that um, if we really live true to the relationships, we will be there. So uh, just take a minute of pause and take your heart and send graces wherever there is brokenness. As Francis was called to repair what was broken. Thank you very much. So um, I have three parts, faithful to Bonaventure. Um, we're going to do three little parts of this. We remember, we celebrate, we believe. And um, we'll go back and look at a little bit of remembering what we celebrate and then um, what we're called to in our belief that moves us forward. Um, I don't know about you, but this really began back in 2017. Uh, Pope Francis uh, issued a document called Ite Vos, which was the 500th anniversary of Ite et Vos that Pope um, Leo X put forward that said, get together, basically, get together. And so um, it's interesting that the friars have done a significant event with their unification, but also through, as Mary Barber mentioned, the committees that are working here to help us to be together. Uh, so this is back there. It's an interesting document. If you want to look it up, it's uh, Ite et Vos. When I was looking at this, I thought, well, we got to remember. And who are we remembering? We're remembering Francis. So, so, so what new can we think about Francis, our brother and our father? We know lots of stories. And again, I'm very conscious that I'm talking to the elect and the chosen. So some of this will be very much review, if not all of it. But I'm also conscious that we don't always think about Francis as a poet. 
a poet. And that gives us a whole different sense of him. We know that from his canticle, The Creatures, which will be significant as we look at relationships. We also know Francis as a skilled architect. He might not have been skilled at first, but he totally renovated San Damiano to be very much like the Church of Vatican II, where the high altar and where the commoners lived came to the same level. So not only did he change the architect of the, of the building, but also as others imitated that, um, changed the, the image of church. Well, it took us maybe 800 years to figure out that that's the way we wanted to go, that God had in mind in repairing the house. And we often, um, my students don't like this, but I talk about him as being a vernacular theologian. He really had groundedness in understanding the theology of uh, the contemporary church, but also looking forward to that. And one of those big things is the incarnation, where he really flipped upside down you know, what that was all about. So those pieces, I think, to get a different view of what we might always think about who Francis is and was. And that's what we want to remember, some of those pieces that are there. Um, we need Francis now, is my firm belief. He is a sign of hope for us. Um, in 1927, a Jesuit, Peter Lippert, said, if God should someday deign to reveal the order of the future of his church, it's longed for by our best people, our youngest, and it will surely bear the stamp of Francis' soul and spirit. 1927. We're still trying to live that out. Many of you know Eric Doyle, who wrote in the Chord, I believe we possess a treasure of inestimable riches. The Franciscan theological tradition has a distinctive, indeed unique, approach to reality, which is needed more now than ever. And I found this quote from Karl Ratzinger, um, who later, Pope Benedict XVI, who said, one day the form of life of St. Francis will become the universal form of the church. The simple and idiot will triumph over the greatest scholars, and the church in a final age will breathe the spirit of Francis' the spirit. And who's elected? Woohoo! yes. Pope Francis' whole bit about synodality is all of that message that's there. So um, we need to carry that on and to, to live it. And, and that's been my challenge as I've read through this sort of things that are there. Certainly we know Francis' conversion. We know that um, he, he failed as a son and a merchant. I'll just name it. He was a failure. And um, I think as a result of that, went outside the city walls down into La Madalena area where the leprosariums were. And I think he was surprised by how the persons with Hansen's disease treated him. I think he really was, as one of the scholars wrote, a homeless housemate among the lepers. A homeless housemate. I think he was a houseless homemate. It's that relationship, right, when you're at home, as Joyce welcomed us today. He also was a failed soldier, which we know. And he was surprised during his imprisonment to have access to the gospel. We know that somehow, hidden somewhere, he had pieces of the scripture. A failed soldier, but things that worked towards his transformation, his conversion. And we also know he was a failed martyr. He wanted to go to the Orient to visit with the, the Sultan and was surprised by the other and finding out he was a brother to him. So these failures helped him in his conversion. And I think, again, as we look at that, it's, it's important to know that it's not always our successes that make us who we are. And so as we look forward to where we are, the failures perhaps in our diplomatic relationships could help us perhaps to see other ways of doing things. I'm going to base some of what I'm talking about um, with a book by one of my um, professors and scholars, Michael Blastic. Um, he looked at the rule of 1221 um, and 1223. So um, I, I don't get credit for everything, but just sort of sort some of it out. So to my brother, Michael. He's right here. <laughs> <laughs>
Francis renounced his patrimony. He gave up that sense of being the son. And that was very important in that relationship because it freed him then to look for other relationships. And ultimately, Bernard of Quintavalli joins him, probably one of his battle mates, probably, as we know that some of um, the experience that we've learned recently of Francis's PTSD and how the brothers kind of hung around together, um, much like our 12-step program do. It's those failures that bring us into successes and relationships stronger than we can. And it was, in fact, because of that, Francis felt, the Lord God gave me brothers. And once Bernard joined Francis, the Franciscan movement began. Otherwise, we would have just had a holy man. But the relationship then built this up. And as Michael said, um, they shared life together. They shared work together. They shared a common mission together. And as importantly, they shared a relationship. And that's really the essence of the talk that we have today, is this relationship that we're going to see. That. And we can see from um, the tabula image there with Francis and um, Bernard of Quintavalli. So we remember back in 1223 when Francis saw the Lord God, their numbers began to increase. And he wrote for himself and his brothers for the present and the future for us. Um, simple and few words, a life and a rule. And significant again, just remember, it's not just a rule. It's a life and a rule. In fact, you can see here in front, but also... Um, it's a rule in life, and it's important, I think, that we remember that it isn't just a set of regulations. It is how we are in relationship to one another. And we know certainly he um, used primarily the Holy Gospel. Um, again, he was a theologian, a vernacular theologian, who spoke the language of the people, not so much Latin. But he inserted some practical ways of doing that, and then merrily went off to Rome with his brothers to present this to Pope Innocent. And that was confirmed. That was the original rule. We also know that, as I said earlier, that the Lord gave him brothers. And then they decided they wanted to live to the form of the Holy Gospel. And they, those who came to receive the life of whatever they had, they gave to the poor. So this was his primary proposal for life. Not a juridical rule, but an evangelical text. And those of you who have lived through the um, the uh, third order regular rule and how that writing is, we know that evangelical life was the core of that. Now, Francis heard that Christ's disciples should possess gold or silver. We know that. Remember the three different texts that he had um, that also in our third order rule. And then immediately he said, this is what I want, this is what I wish, this is what I long for with all my heart. Those gospel texts named Francis's experience when he gave up everything that he had and lived out of the city, when he lost his relationship in terms of patrimony to his father and or his mother, that then formed his life and the rule was written as a result of that. And what he had most of all was a bit of joy, which he did not have before, a deep joy, not as we know, just gladness, but a deep joy. And it was in the relationship that he experienced not only with his brothers, but with his brother Jesus. Now, when they came back from Rome, the brothers conferred together. We read this right out of Chilano. Whether they should live among the people or go off to solitary places. And we know that story of him trying to figure out if he should be a hermit or whether he should be a uh, a Dominican, you know, and go out and preach among the people. So, But Francis realized in the conferring together that that's how he could listen to the Holy Spirit. Obedience doesn't happen alone. Franciscan obedience is always listening in the community, in the community, listening with others. Um, the, the original rule of the earlier rule, excuse me, of 1221, was not written like Francis went up to the mountain and listened to the Holy Spirit and then wrote it down, like Moses did in tablets or whatever. But it was in talking with his brothers and understanding in that relationship. And I believe also talking with the, the women. 
Claire was part of that conversation. It helped because Claire was actually living the life because because of circumstances, she couldn't go out like the, the men could. And so there was this sense of solid um, 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 stability where she lived there at San Damiano. And what came out of this was a primitive chapter. They had common discussions, common prayer, and the evangelical life to live the form of gospel. So we know that the rule of 1221 um, is really the life over the law. And that was the foundation for the one we're going to celebrate here, the later rule of 1223. We can see, in fact, when you do studies, that the word life appears 32 times in the text. The rule, two times. Do you see the, the, the foundation that said that the rule is really mostly about the living of this way of life? And the rule moves from a lived experience to reflection on that in light of the Gospels always in light of the Gospels. And of course, they incorporated a few canons from latter and four, such as the Easter duty, um, care of the sacrament, um, and things like that. So this then gives cause to the rule of 1223. A lot of people say that legends are like he lost that one. I don't know if he lost it or that he lost um, uh, popularity. <laughs> it was a little bit too long and too much for that. We also have to remember that in 1220, there was a lot of tension when Francis came back from the Orient. And he, that's the time when he resigned his position. He relinquished the role of being a general minister, which Melanie knows really well what that's about. So, <laughs> It really was a very difficult time for the fraternity. He had completed his mission to Damietto. Um, and the relationship with the, the poor ladies was really challenging because the friars didn't want to spend so much time with the ladies. And yet the ladies relied on the friars to do their begging for them. And there were issues with the persons with Hansen's disease, with the lepers. And, of course, the curio got involved. So Hugolino comes in and, you know, this isn't what we like. It's got to change here or whatever. But as a result of conferring together, working it out together, I think a whole lot like this with the friars coming together after 20 years of discussion, 20 years to make it come to that point, the papal bull was finally signed on November 29, 1223. So the rule comes as a result of the, the living of it as well as the discussion about that. And I think, again, the synodal process invites us to that same kind of experience, the talking about it and the living about it. That's why Pope Francis says the synod isn't going to be over when the synod's over. It is a walking into, continually, the future of what we are about. So out of these tensions, or what I might say sometimes the failure of the discussions, um, comes then the rule that we celebrate this year the 800th anniversary of that. And you can see that it has been preserved. Any of you who've been to Assisi at the Basilica of Santa Chiara, you can see this, a copy of it that's there. Um, it's all one long sentence, uh, or, or I should say one long writing of it. There's no breaks in the chapters or whatever. Uh, Hugolino does that a little bit later. But that's the original rule of 1223, known as the later rule, or the regula bulata, the rule with... The, the papal seal, which is at the bottom down here, you can see, that enables them to then live this for 800 years. This is the one that they celebrate. So um, interesting is that November 29th, there was a final chapter, the St. Michael chapter, after which the rule was taken to the Curia, reviewed by Cardinal Hugolino, who then makes it a little bit more nice and you know, fixes it up pretty and everything. He signs it, he gets the, um, the Pope to sign it, and it gets <coughs> sealed. Um, you can see on that, um, the, the previous page, the seal that was hanging down at the bottom of that. Right. So Francis now, having resigned in 1220, feeling his completeness in this, that they have a rule to live, that he can pass that on, doesn't want to deal with all the tensions that are going on, Francis goes to the Rieti Valley. 
So the connection here is very significant. November 29th, signed, sealed, and delivered, he goes off to the Rieti Valley. And what happens in the Rieti Valley is Francis pays attention to his deepest desire. In a sense, you might say, um, I've done what was mine to do. Now, now, now what is mine as little brother Francis to do? What will I do now that I'm no longer the, the general minister, although he never used that title, but what is it that, that's theirs to do? And he goes off to a, a home place, a place where he feels most comfortable. And those of you who have traveled there, you know to go to the Rieti Valley. He walked it, didn't take a nice bus, and he had time as he was walking with his brothers and maybe a few of the sisters there to get in touch with his, his deepest desire now. And we can see here, as Chilano writes, that his greatest attention was to pay heed to the Holy Gospel, observare, to observe the Holy Gospel, to pay heed to that in all things and through all things because he wanted to follow the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and to retrace, or what we would say in Italian, imitare, to retrace his footsteps completely with all vigilance and all zeal, all the desire of his soul and with the fervor of his heart. So he's in the Rieti Valley. He's visiting his friends in Greccio. And what happens then is this, I think, very significant cat connection between the rule of 1223 and Greccio, his lived experience. And he gives birth then a new Bethlehem, not in Palestine, but in, a, in Italy. And we're going to pay attention to how significant the links of those are, because it's, I think, through Greccio, and as Michael points out, Blastic points out, it's what connects the relationship piece. Not the rule, but the life. I love your nods. Thank you very much. So we remember. We remember that during this time, Francis imitates a born in simplicity, this poverty, the humility of Greccio. And so I invite you just for a contemplative pause while I take a little sip of water. What struck you as we just talked about what we remember? Because in this event, the celebration of that rule, the life, we are to reveal then the interconnectedness of all people and all earth. Are you with me so far? Some of the stories of Francis, sometimes I think after we read them all, we, we really want to like, well, what, 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 what is it that we remember about Francis? Yeah. Excellent. So I think significantly here is we want to invite ourselves to do Greccio. Because the meaning of Greccio, as we can see from this um, Giotto's painting in the St. Francis Basilica, is that the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Francis takes the scripture passage from John 1.14 and makes it present. Not that the word became flesh, but the word becomes flesh. Not that God dwells, dwelt among us, but dwells among us. Very significant. And from then on, Francis always took the scriptures and talked about them in the present tense, not a past tense. Not what was, not what we remember, but what we celebrate. The heart of the Christian tradition is that Jesus Christ, the Godhead, becomes human. And by doing this, God reveals the goodness of the created order in which he becomes a part of that. He assumes goodness. And we know the foundation of Francis' spirituality, although it's concerned with a personal, social, and natural world, in his Christian belief, the incarnation is core. It is significant. 
It's not more important than Easter, but it's certainly as important as Easter because Easter would never have happened if we hadn't had Christmas. Duh! So unlike theologians who emphasize the fallen state of creation as a result of sin, Francis's our spirituality emphasizes the goodness of God. We talk about the original goodness, not only original sin, and becomes significant, significant for us. And we know so much of this from John Duns Scotus, a Franciscan who took Francis's theology and wrote it in such a way that it was presentable to the curia. And it becomes then, the incarnation, a hallmark for the Franciscan intellectual tradition. Duns Scotus argued that the incarnation of Christ was not an afterthought. And you all know this, right? We know it wasn't an afterthought. It was not dependent on Adam's fall. But it would be the base for the rich Christian theology of incarnation incarnation. Scotus said because of the goodness of creation, God would have become human even if Adam or Eve had not sinned. For 13.7 billion years, the creator God created the cosmos so that God's self could become one with us. God just wanted to play with us. As you might have heard Bill Short say, if that hadn't been true, it would be like building the Taj Mahal to cover a pothole. <laughs> Human sin is a pothole, and we wouldn't have Christ, this Taj Mahal, to cover that. Because right? Jesus is so much more than that. So Nice image from <laughs> Brother Bill. So what, we, what I want to emphasize here is that the life of that rule comes out of the Greccio experience where Francis enacts a memory of the gospel of Jesus. The humility of, of uh, the incarnation and the charity that passion occupied him all the time. That's all he could think about. Um, and so we know that the spirit was at work within him. To do Greccio is to participate in making the kingdom real in Wheaton, in Joliet, in Frankfurt, now. Greccio captures the heart of the rule in life. It is, in fact, to build up a crib and bring birth to a church. Not so much that we bring the ass and the ox in there, but in fact we bring our brother ass, whoever you might want to name that ass, or our <laughs> brother ox, who's stubborn as, right? Do you have friends like that or community members? And we bring them into the Greccio scene so that we can feast on the birthing of the kingdom. It's not so important that we think Francis invented the crash because those Italians had it long before that. But he made it real. He brought it forward and he challenged the persons of Greccio to enact that, to make it real. And we continue then to celebrate this humility as the minoritas and we celebrate the poverty of Jesus, because that's what Greccio was. If you've been to Greccio, it's not the rich and famous. It's the poor and the simple who live there. And Francis, I love this quote from Ronchilano, he filled the whole world with the gospel of Christ. He made his whole body a tongue. Remember, he didn't so much pray as become a prayer. His very being spoke as perhaps the lips of San Damiano spoke to him. When people were in Francis's presence, they felt that holiness. And the challenge is, can others feel that when we are in others' presence? And do we feel that of others? Is goodness what we reveal in our space, in our time, and through this matter? The whole of creation is the place to encounter Christ. The whole of creation. And we are to give birth to that. We are to make that happen, to make it real in what we are about. And so we celebrate, because I believe this then makes the rule 
and Greccio so linked together the foundation for fraternitas, this experience that we're talking about, relationships as sisters and brothers. Francis says, make your body a tongue. Preach the gospel at all times, but let your body do that. Let your expression, how you treat one another, how I treat one another, in poverty and humility, in a very concrete living presence. Can we be brother and sister to one another? Because annunciations are happening all the time. When I get up in the morning, I hear an annunciation, and it's not always an angel. Sometimes it's my angel sisters who say, Smee, do you remember to do this? Or to compliment something that I had done. Those annunciations where we've had an opportunity to reveal our relationship to one another. And you know these Della Robias if you've been um, to Laverna, right? Beautiful annunciation here. And we know that Mary is just enraptured with the Holy Spirit in the center, the very core of this painting, or this um, Della Robbia issue. And you can see God as Father up there holding God's breath when the, the Spirit, or when the angel says, will you bear my son? And I believe that that happens to us every contemplative moment that we have. And sometimes not so contemplative when we get shaken out of our, our comfortability. And at this moment in time, will you bear Christ for me? Will you be brother to those that are there? And we also know how significant then when Mary says yes, and the word becomes flesh. Again, we can see it in the present tense where, the, where God is so excited that Mary is bearing the son and gives birth. And the angels are all dancing as God's angels do when we say our fiat. Our little fiat, it doesn't have to be a big deal or whatever, but are we participating in birthing a new vision of being human? And doesn't the world need that today? Wouldn't you love to just fly over to Putin and just say, can we just have a talk? Can we just talk about this Israeli-Palestinian relationship? These are our brothers and sisters. Can we love one another? There's enough to go around. Abadunza, as the Italians would say. Can we help others rediscover the interconnectedness of all people? Who would have guessed that six provinces would have given up their power, their privilege, their money, and become one? Okay, so six out of seven, not bad. <laughs> Who would have guessed? But in time, can we participate in that? And I think, again, admonition five, Francis says, consider human beings. What a great, excellent God has placed in you. For you were born and formed in the image of this beloved son and according to the likeness of the spirit. Can the spirit be alive in me? Can I see that spirit, that love, that goodness, that humor, that joy in my brothers and sisters that I live with? Because as we've heard in um, the, the later rule, we should be happy to live among the poor, to live among the powerless, the sick, and the lame. Because our Lord Jesus Christ was poor and a stranger who lived on alms. We are called to imitate that. For the Spirit is at work among us, it says in that rule. So take a minute and think, what does it mean to imitate the gospel? Imitare. Imitare. It's not complicated. We are just to live and love as Jesus does. Does, not did, does in and through us. So I'm going to jump onto this. You already know this. You've heard me say this over and over again. It's all about fraternitas. We know from John's gospel that Jesus first called those followers by name. Andrew, Simon, come follow me. Then he talked about them as being disciples. Sit at my feet, learn from me. 
And he called them apostles. Go forth and do good out there. And then he begins to be more intimate, and he refers to them as little children. Huh. Because he probably saw how they acted. <laughs> and we know this from the Eucharistic image, image that's there, that priestly prayer where Francis talks about it. The core of the gospel message is to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus came to show us how to love. How to love. That's the essence of the incarnation. And can we build that bonds of unity that's there? Certainly after that, we know at that Last Supper, and Joan Chittister loves this. It's the end of her book, and she says, you know, the whole bit about Benedictine community is that we become friends, intimate friends, because everything we reveal to one another, we share around the table. But Sandra Schneider says that's not the end of the story. As we study in John's Gospel, post-resurrection event in John's Gospel, chapter 20, this is the ultimate, the pen up on ultimate of the salvific act. is Jesus refers to those followers. Go and tell my brothers and sisters, I'll meet them in Galilee. Where you are, I'll meet you there as brother, as sister. Huh? The salvific act of the Christ is that Jesus is brother to all of us. Jesus says to each one of us, I'm your brother, I'm your brother. Just like Cardinal Bernadine said, I'm your brother. And that is the essence then of the rule in life. He experienced that. Huh? Francis picked up on this so much. Like they talk in the African Ubuntu. You're not a person except through others. Huh? We are in that relationship. So this fraternitas is so significant. And I always tease it's a feminine word even though it's about the male relationship of Jesus with all of us. So it's a very nurturing concept that's there. Can we live this fraternitas? And it's exactly the core of the gospel and therefore the core of the rule of 1223, how we treat one another. And so what is it that we celebrate? We celebrate Christmas every day, every day. But it's not the decorations, I hate to tell you. This tree is an incarnation tree. It's to remind us that we are rooted in the gospel. And it's the incarnation every day of our life. I don't know if you've been to the Holy Land, but I have a privilege there. And to go to that, you have to go through to see where this, um, the, the birth of Jesus supposedly happened, but probably he did or whatever. To get into that church, you have to go through this door. Now, it was built so in fact the Saracens wouldn't bring their horses in. But interestingly enough, you got to bend down just like the camel who has to take his things off to pass through the eye of the needle. Huh? It's called the door of humility. And to get then to the altar of nativity where you can see here this star where in fact down below is on top of what, in fact, is that spot, marking, in fact, the grotto, the grotto of the Nativity. Some of you may have been at St. Mary Major in Rome, and you can see then a partial piece of the, the actual crib, um, and at the top is this little golden baby Jesus there, just as a reminder of that experience that's there. But these aren't the incarnational signs that we want. Jesus is inviting each of us to be an incarnational sign. How are you incarnation to the world? What is our spirituality where everyone knows goodness is born because of us? That goodness is here and now. Not 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Not 800 years ago in Greccio. But here. And not just on 1225, but every day when the Annunciation happens and we are asked to give birth. What is it that we celebrate in this incarnational moment? Can we reveal this relationship of fraternitas that Jesus spent his life to show us? What are we doing to participate in the birthing of a new vision of being human in a world 
very badly broken and very much in need of this Franciscan theology. And we want to remember, Francis was merely a deacon to make this event happen. One more, are you ready? Good? All right. So the last one is we believe. And Ketchett and Esser suggest that any critical study of the Franciscan way is to ask a further question. What meaning does this have for me and for us? What is the meaning? So what? So what Jesus was born? So what Francis had Greggio? Now what? And I think I'm going to lean heavily here on Pope Francis because he's linked his entire papacy to the spiritual legacy and humanistic vision of the poor man of Assisi. Francis. The name that he didn't even dream of taking on. It was just somebody else who said we need to remember the poor. And he took the name Francis. And I believe our Pope Francis, as Jesuit as he is, who learned from the Franciscans, all right, because Ignatius came 300 years later, Pope Francis is really showing us an incredible vision of our Franciscan way of being. And we just have to follow along with him. So again, what's the meaning? It's to observe the Holy Gospel. Every rule, first, second, third, fourth, and secular, starts out the, the way of life is to observe the Holy Gospel. And what does that mean from our rule? It says be gentle, peaceful, mild, and humble, not quarrelsome, not judgmental. Wow, wouldn't the world be wonderful, huh? Yeah. It should be obvious that we are joyful, good-humored, happy in the Lord because we know Jesus is our brother, and most importantly because we know Jesus loves us. God loves each one of us in an intimate, intimate way. And that's very clear from the gospel. We know that Jesus says the greatest of all commandments is to love God and to love one another. All the other laws, all the other regulations, everything depends on this. And Francis discovered the deep, tender love of this God and teaches us that story. He was impelled then to let everybody know that, even to the point of the uh, Portiuncula pardon. Don't let your sins get in the way. God has already forgiven you. So I want to look at a bit of today what it is that we believe. We believe, along with Pope Francis, that there is joy in the gospel. We want to take advantage of this time right now as Franciscans. I think Francis has three, Pope Francis has three significant documents we need to pay attention to. Evangelii Gaudium, Laudato Si, and Fratelli Tutti. Evangelium Gaudium is why do we do this? Because we've discovered the love of God, the core of the gospel. What is it that we do? We care for creation, Laudato Si. And who and how do we do that? By becoming brothers and sisters. Pretty simple. 800 years later, it takes a Jesuit pope to teach us what we should be doing and what we should know. Huh? No one is to be excluded from the joy brought, brought by the study of the Gospels. What a happy face on this man, huh? We believe in this joy of the Gospel. As you know, he prefers a church that's bruised. And if something should rightly disturb our conscience, it is because we are living without the understanding of that gospel. I don't know about you, but I've cried through the news the last two weeks. I don't know those people, but they're my sisters and brothers. Somehow, it just moves us to be present to that. And Pope Francis invites us that we can't be exempt from that. We have to be concerned for the poor. Very clearly, Pope Francis is saying in his last um, Laudato Deum is that we need to be careful that our words don't take over our actions. We need to act. 
We can't just sit and say to the Beatitudes of the Gospel, but we need to move to Catholic social teachings to act out on these. In particular here, Evangelio Gaudium calls us truly to act with a preferential option for the poor. Who's the lonely sister who doesn't get to supper, huh? Who's the one in the back of the classroom that doesn't believe in himself? Who are the poor of our world today that need our prayers, our graces sent in their direction? Pope Francis calls us to a change. Or maybe we're just too comfortable. And that's a challenge. Um, we've been struggling in Joliet trying to get uh, housing for the homeless. And not in my neighborhood, as we've seen elsewhere, huh? That's tough. But it would cause a change in my lifestyle, a change in my neighbors, a change in my connection. And I know no one wants change except a baby with wet diapers, but <laughs> we need to look at changes in our life. If it doesn't change us, we probably haven't taken it all in. And Francis calls us, particularly in Laudato Si, to be in relationship with all other people. Every act of cruelty towards any creature is contrary to human dignity. And here we see the Catholic social teachings of care for all creation. Before we move into recycling, the code is reduce. Do I need all of that? Yeah, sure, I can take plastic to the, to the recycle, but do I need all of those things? Reduce reuse, then recycle. A big challenge for us, as Francis calls us to the care of our common home. We have to recognize the inherent goodness, not only of human, but non-human creation, because it impacts the poor. And I know you know all this, but can I act on it? Can humanity survive without direct support from the millions of other creatures the microbes that will break down the garbage, and the massive trees that give us something to breathe. And so much of creation is interconnected to that. Some of you may have read an article recently by Dan Horan who talks about echophobia, that we don't want to talk about it anymore. And I think we have a little bit of fatigue, I'm sort of tired of that. Huh? But it's the mindfulness that calls us to direct support for our creatures. We are all called, as Pope Francis says, to an ecological conversion, to be in relationship with the world around us. We must live our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork. God's handiwork. Imagine a famous painting that we put in the back room with the rest of the garbage. How are we caring and tender, tenderly caring for the earth? What little ways can I do that? as Francis was attentive to all the languages of the species of the birds that were there. And you'll notice he's got no sandals on. He's in the mud and the muck with the rest of them. Can I be willing to step into those places where in fact we can make a difference of our world? And his new Laudato Deum invites us that. He's like, I wrote this eight years ago and you still didn't pay attention to me. So I'm going to write you another one. It's a little shorter, but it doesn't say a whole lot different than that. And we know how this impacts the poor. And lastly, again, a core of social teaching here is solidarity. To be brothers and sisters, to know ourselves as related to one another. This is that fraternitas. And Fratelli Tutti just simply gives us that Franciscan message. To be in relationship with our sisters and brothers. And it's the core of this where we are called to express the essence of fraternal openness. Or what we might see as the, we culminate this in the Canto of Creatures, a universal fraternitas, all of creation. And it challenges each of us in our relationship. Or maybe it's because we've forgotten how to love one another. It's a challenge. And I don't take this as just information. You have challenged me to look again, seriously. How am I living my Franciscan calling? 
because I think these give us a sense of hope. There is a way out of the conflict that we have. If we can move past our greatest fear, to be loved and to love. We long to be in that relationship with one another, to give ourselves nobly to one another. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I fear the cost of that love. It's tough. I choose sometimes just to be safe and comfortable and going about getting up, brushing my teeth, going to work, coming home and going to have supper and going back to bed. It's a routine for me. But can I be shaken out of that? so that I can be, as we've said, in relationship with my sisters and brothers. I love this image here where Francis invites us to be a womb, to provide a safe and holding place where life can grow. Even if it's just at three in the morning when you wake up and you can't go back to sleep, can I have a womb that takes graces and sends them to the broken part of the world? a space which God provides for all, a sacred place that widens those relationships for me. As we know, Francis writes, we are mothers when we bear him in our heart. And that's what Fratelli Tutti continues to remind us about. But it's through this practice of contemplative prayer, at, the, at least the core of it, to be more compassionate. Judy Canato says that Jesus went beyond superficial divisions and called for a culture of compassion. Because compassion changes everything. Compassion heals. It mends the broken. It restores, as Bonaventure would say, what has been lost. Compassion draws us together because you can't have compassion on your own. It's to suffer with, to suffer with. And I think as the core of that, that is what we believe. We believe we are called to be people of compassion, to live our Catholic social teachings in action whenever those annunciations come to us, including to our church, which might be in need of repair, including our democracy, which may need to relearn what it's calling it to. I share with you this prayer of gratitude written by Barbara Holmes. She gives thanks for the crises, the disruption of order, and the plunge into contemplation. We are grateful for the welcoming darkness and the wounds that bring us to a place of unknowing. We thank you, God, for the nurture of our many villages of belonging. We are grateful. For the healing that comes in unexpected ways and the imaginative pathways of a futurism and cosmic rebirth. Thanks be to God. I think this is what Francis talked about when he talked about the holy newness. A new Bethlehem, a new Jerusalem, a new way of living, a new way of loving, rooted in one that Jesus Christ has taught us. Not to do the same old, same old, but to look at new ways of being sisters and brothers to one another. That our heart can get bigger, as the little trees of the flower said. Can I borrow your heart, Lord, because mine isn't big enough. You know that story? It's wonderful. I pray that often. I don't want to forget Claire, because she is part of it, and I only have two minutes here. I think Claire very much lived and shows for us this model. I think she can teach us a sense of this mutuality to become models of compassion as she lived with her sisters, to become models of inclusion as she worked with the brothers, and to become a model of communion as she was connected to the whole world. She can teach us this beyond our fears, beyond our fatigue, and beyond our forgetfulness. <coughs> so what are we called to repair? And what must we relearn? What kind of conversion must we go through? I believe our Franciscan way of life that Pope Francis continually calls us to 
can be a hopeful sign that there is a way, and it's the gospel way. And it is, in fact, as the rule in life tells us, it is a way of being in fraternitas, simply sisters and brothers to one another, to be in solidarity, care for our common home, and give a preferential option for the poor. And that brings us joy. So I hope you don't look like you're coming back from a funeral. That took my students. Huh? We need to look joyful. We need to because inside the source of our joy is our relationship with Jesus Christ. for this wonderful presentation. You know, we have so much to ponder and now to act upon as well when we look at what's happening in our world with the wars, the immigration and refugee crisis, the destruction of our common home, and how important it is to see one another as brother and sister and to live that out. Not just to say it in words, but to act on it. So thank you, Mary Elizabeth. Um, and at this time, we're going to take uh, time out for questions or comments that you would like to make. And I have the portable mic, so if you have something you would like to say or a question, raise your hand and I'll come around with the portable mic. Questions? Um, I was taken by the part, of, especially at the end, about compassion. I have been thinking about this lately, and one of the things that strikes me is that um, maybe a spirituality of compassion is something that is evolving in all of us right now. Um, Partly because all of those tragedies that we've talked about now come into our living room. Sixty years ago, they didn't come into our living room. And many of you, my generation, probably still have that image of that little girl from Vietnam with her dress on fire. And I think for me, that was the first time I felt the horror of war being in my living room. And now when I think about what comes in on the news in my living room, it's even more a call for a spirituality of compassion, which relates to what we've been saying here as brother and sister. And I don't know if it's a new spirituality for us, but I think it's um, definitely a deeper one. And I really appreciate the um, connection to our Franciscan spirituality and the call to be brother and sister and therefore to have a spirituality of compassion. And I don't know if you want to add to that, but... I think you're right in some ways, Joyce, it's not uh, new. It's still the gospel. That's why when you said talk about this, I thought this is 2,000 years old and all of you guys are nodding your heads when I'm talking <laughs> here. Um, but it, it does give us pause to think about how am I compassion to others. Um, so far away, um, and, and I really do believe at three in the morning when I just can't sleep that, that we're being called into showering embraces as best we can. Some are called to go to the borders um, in, in physical ways of doing that. Um, and so um, I, I, I think the question is, do we love enough to move into that spirituality of compassion? And that can only come from the graces of God. Each of us will have to answer that in our own way, and each of us will stand before God, and God will say, how much did you love? God's not going to say, did you follow all the rules? How much did you love? That's the rule, the core of the gospel. I love the smiles. Huh? Yeah. I'm sure you have some thoughts and, and pieces. Don't feel that this is just sharing with one another. 
in the light of, is it on? It's on. Um, I was thinking about uh, Francis going to the Sultan. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? I think he is, can be our patron saint during this time when we have uh, such sorrow over the things that are happening in the Holy Land and uh, praying to our Lord for, for our Lord's homeland. I mean, Lord, save your country. Uh, but could you speak to that a little bit? Um, how Francis was able to get in there and talk to the Sultan and uh, what courage that took for him. So the patron saint, in a way that he can be a light for us during this time of sorrow for those people suffering over there. I, I do believe that... Speak to that. <laughs> that uh, uh, it, it's certainly an incredible piece to our Franciscan theology and spirituality. Um, Francis really went to become a martyr. That, that was his intention. He hoped to be killed for that so that others could know, you know that there was a relationship that was there. I think Francis is as much a patron for us as was the Sultan al Khalil. Both of them were incredible, wonderful people. And um, I think that's the challenge is to, to take both of that in, and, and certainly for the Holy Land today. Um, it belongs to all people. Um, and, and, um, and I don't want to get political about it, but you all know it belonged to the Palestinians long before the Israelis started to think this was theirs and they were going to capture it and, and make it their land. So it's a, it's a, it's a 2,000 year old struggle that's not something new. And, and the idea here is, can we live together in peace and harmony? Do we have to conquer? No one wins in a war, including the earth. I'll share one little story. When I, um, I working with the Franciscan Pilgrimage Program, for a couple of years I directed, I worked with uh, the, the veterans. And it, it was a challenge to take the vets over there. Um, we did a lot of hiking because they were all doing their battle stuff or whatever. But we went to um, the place where the Battle of Calistrata um, originally happened where Francis was captured. And the, the program, the pilgrimage program, never had done that before, but one of the taxi drivers, we kind of bribed him to take us there, and he took us to a little place that was there in the little town of Calistrata, which still is um, an active little village that's there. And um, we had um, the oldest member of our pilgrimage was from the Vietnam War. And the whole time, he had never spoken Never said a word. He took in, he listened to everything that we were saying. And this relates, I think, to the Holy Land. And um, finally, um, we were standing there talking, and the taxi driver was saying, somewhere out there was the battle. You can see Perugia up there, and Assisi behind us. Uh, I know it was somewhere out there, but we don't know where it was. And just like that, this elderly man took off in his best run out into the field. And I didn't know, you know, we didn't know what was going on, whether he was having a PTSD moment or whatever. And he gets out part way out there and he falls on his knees and he's weeping. And I went up to him and I just put my hand on his shoulder as I said, I'd like to put my hand on your shoulder if you're okay. He said, please, because the earth is still weeping. This is where the battle happened. The earth is still weeping. And I, I think very much so that holy land is everywhere. It's not just in Jerusalem. I don't have answers, but I do think we need to, to allow Francis, like you said, and the Sultan, to be patrons for us. They found a relationship. As a result of that, as you know, Francis was given a um, the ivory and a horn, which allowed him to go back to Assisi without being martyred. He walks into all this tension that we were talking about. But Camille and the Muslims were starved to death. Their whole group was starved to death. You always think about the other side of that. There are no winners in the war. 
even if it's the little nitty bitty battles that we have with one another, it's in the relationship. It's that compassion that Joyce invites us to. I don't know, that just was in my head. I don't have real answers. I was already feeling compassion with the Palestinians when this all started, you know, thinking the Israelis have been starving them for years, you know, and being mean to them. And um, last weekend I happened to be in Toledo for a wedding, and when we were coming on Friday night from, from the banquet hall to our hotel, there was a, a demonstration going on. We thought maybe it was a homecoming or something, but it was people with their uh, truck with the Palestinian flag, and we were stopped at the stoplight where all the people were standing there with their, with their you know, um, cart cartons, and, and the one lady had one says, no, no, no food, no medicine, no electricity, you know. It, it just brought it closer to home, you know, because we don't see many around here, but uh, that was, you know, a real enlightenment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, sister. And as Joyce said, as hard as that is, bring it into our living room. You know, our students would say, I don't watch the news, it's too hard for me. Yeah. Sir Albert Gray, has yeah, it. Just, take the microphone, please. Okay. I was going to say that the longer I live, the more I realize um, how humbling it is to and what a gift it is to have been called to be a Franciscan. Um, and, and always trying to find ways to make that spirit of peace or joy present in the life, in the circumstances in which we live right now. Because that all helps somewhere else to we hope. And as Claire said, we must most be grateful for our vocation. And Pope Francis is telling us what it's like to live that, truly. Yeah. Such gratitude. Well, as Mary Barber said, um, I hope I've given you something, food for thought. You have some questions or whatever, but just um, continue to think about the calling that we are to be models of compassion, to, to, to become, let our bodies be a tongue. Isn't that a fun expression? <laughs> um, so think about that at Thanksgiving when we're <laughs> so, that expression can be there. So, I, I think maybe if we can allow, there's some wonderful cookies back there, and just maybe do some sharing with one another. I'm not going anywhere, and we're grateful for our brothers and sisters who are online. I'm so glad because they didn't c c need to pollute the earth or whatever, so they could pick it up online that's there. So, And I'm also very grateful for all of you here. As Joyce said, you're more than welcome to hang around. This is our home. This is your home. Um, we try to be models of communion and uh, open up our space to you. So any other thoughts, just, I think, just maybe share with one another and chow down on those cookies and enjoy them to celebrate today. Be a sign of hope. The world needs our Franciscan spirit. So. Peace to each one of you. Amen. Amen.